welcome back to the Candy Colored Studio. I'm artist Katrina Berg, and this is episode 238. Wow. Welcome, friend. I'm happy to be with you again this week. Let's start with some gratitude. Today, I am so grateful because this week we got to spend a day together as a family down in Manti, Utah, going to see the Manti Temple open house. And that was especially monumental for us. This May, my husband Carl and I are celebrating 20 years since we were sealed in that beautiful temple. It's a very traditional thing in our family. My parents, my grandparents, Carl's parents, and his, I think some of his family members, maybe not his grandparents, but we've had a lot of family members be sealed in the Manti Temple. So it was really special to take the kids to go back to show them the room we were sealed in, the room where their grandparents were sealed in. Anyways, it was very, very special. So I'm feeling a lot of gratitude today for ancestors, ancestors especially who are willing to give up everything and to go live in a different place. And we had an interesting conversation on the way home. You know, I was getting nostalgic and it's just so beautiful in San Pete County. I spent most of my vacations there hanging out with my cousins and my grandparents and aunts and uncles. And so it's a really special place for me. I ran into an aunt and uncle at the open house, a cousin <laughs> and cousins of my cousin. So it was very special. But um, yeah, it's just amazing how like it's just amazing to think that people are willing to give up everything and to travel to a foreign land and to totally start over and so i'm grateful for ancestors who did that today all right manifesting today i am manifesting safety learning and healing for our missionaries um I'm specifically thinking about LDS missionaries, but I know there's missionaries all over the world doing good and helping everyone in any way that they can. And so that's what I'm manifesting today. Now, as for a studio update, if you look behind me, I have this beautiful painting that's going to certain women. And of course it's so beautiful because it has a Todd Orchard frame on it and it sparkles and has just enough of bling and it's just absolutely wonderful. And then another thing that Todd brought me I'm wondering if you can even see it. Um, can you see that huge oval that I can barely even capture in the camera? I'm not sure what view you're getting, but anyways, there you go. That is what I'm working on next. And I guess the, the key word there would be sweet. That is a little preview of what that piece is gonna be. And so I'm super excited about that. So that's basically what's going on in the studio. And then I thought, you know, last week I did an episode about grief. And if you haven't listened to it, it's episode 237. And I'm hoping this is kind of the start of just being able to talk more about grief because I think it's something that everybody is experiencing right now. And so I wanted to share a strategy that I forgot to share in last week's episode. And I think I'll be sharing lots of things about this. But anyways, one thing that I thought about was that when my husband's father passed away, and we were so sad. And what I what helped me was that every night once the kids were in bed, Carl was busy studying because he was working on his MBA. But I would sit there and I would go through photos. And I created a photo book with all the photos that all of our family members had gathered for his um, funeral. And then also I asked family members to write down any memories that they had specifically with Dale. And so, and then even the kids, the little kids that couldn't like write memories, they drew pictures and it was so sweet. So we have this beautiful photo book um, with all kinds of memories of Dale. And so for a long time, whenever it was his birthday or his the anniversary of his passing, we would pull that out and read it with the kids. And that was extra special. So I'm so grateful to have that. I'm so grateful for family members <laughs> that were willing to hurry and do that because he passed away in March. And I think we gave it to his mom and then his aunt and uncle for like Mother's Day around Mother's Day. And so that was really special that we were able to do that. It was also, it was just really helpful for me to help me grieve because I could sit there and read these stories and see the pictures of things that had happened, um, just getting to know Dale a little bit better. So that's my suggestion or opportunity for you for uh, if you're going through grief of a loss of a family member. And I mean, even photo books, it can be, even if you're not losing a family member, if your grief is about change, again, you could do a photo book about like favorite memories that help you kind of transition that change. Anyways, there's lots of things that I think that um, photo books are really helpful for. So there you go. And then the red pill for today, 
I love to watch, well, I listen to stuff while I paint and I love to listen to series. And the one that I'm kind of re-listening to right now is Madam Secretary. I don't know if you've ever watched that. I was watching it when it was coming out live, but now I'm like re-listening and I love to listen to series or like movies um, where I already know the characters and I can just listen. I already know the movie. And so that's super helpful. So one thing in this episode that they were sharing, they were talking about a journalist that I think was imprisoned in a foreign country. Anyways, it doesn't matter. The point is what they said when they were talking about how important it was to get him back. They said, sometimes the stories we want to hear the least are the stories that we need to hear the most. And I thought that was really, it just impacted me a lot this week. Because there's been a lot of interesting things coming out this week. For example, we had the Moscow attack and that was horrible. And there's been a lot of like news stories and articles and people sharing like who's behind it. It's interesting because, you know, we, if that had happened here, my question is what, where would we be already a week past? I think it's been about a week since that happened. And then the other thing I was thinking about was the Baltimore bridge crash, uh, P Diddy being so-called his homes being raided and so-called arrested. I don't know if he's been arrested, but the homes were raided. And I think some of his family members were arrested. So again, sometimes the stories that we want to hear the least are the ones that we need to hear the most. And I think that that's so true for me personally, when COVID hit and all, we, I was learning all kinds of things that were happening in the world. I didn't want to hear the things that were happening, but I needed to hear them so that I could process and move forward and really just become a better me. Right. So that's, that's the red pill for the week. Just things to think about. And then let's jump into some opportunities for collectors. So this week I've noticed that there are a lot of auctions like spring auctions, mostly fundraisers that are going to be happening very soon, or, um, they're in the process of like getting all the information together. So this is the time to keep an eye out for those. One that I'm gonna be participating in is the Early Light Institute, and they have scholarships for preschool students. And so I've done that, I think this will be my fourth year, either my third or fourth year, I've done, done it quite a few times. Anyway, so that's happening, I wanna say the first week of April. So keep an eye out for that. And then Habitat for Humanity, I got an email from them. And so they are gonna be doing a fundraiser with by selling art. So that should be coming soon. And then another big opportunity for collectors is the Springville Salon, as in the Springville Museum of Art, their 100th salon is happening in April this year. And it's amazing. So if you go on their website, you can read about the history of the Springville Museum and their salon. And it started with the art students of their high school. And so there are stories of people that, you know, were involved with various salons long time ago, art students, high school students, really, really awesome. So it's their 100th salon. So keep an eye out for that. Plan on being there. Usually the openings for the Springville Museum shows are always on a Wednesday night, but I think because this is such a big event, they're having it on a Saturday. It's going to be April 27th. And so if you have a chance, I would totally recommend you go. I'm totally going to go whether I get into the show or not. I'm going to go. We've already made a, made a plan because this is just so momentous and I'm so excited to go and celebrate with my fellow local artists and to celebrate all the artists and the curators and those students of the high school that came from a long time ago and have created this amazing event. So again, the 100th Springville Museum of Art, Springville Salon. So that's coming up. Now, opportunities for artists right along those lines. If you are an artist, the intake for the Springville Museum's 100th Springville Salon is next week. So it's Thursday through Saturday. And so I would definitely recommend looking at that and applying it's going to be great. In fact, you don't even have to pay to apply this year because some amazing donor um, gave a great donation so that all the entries are free. And so that's exciting. That's if you've been putting it off, I would say definitely apply. It'll be a great opportunity to participate and just to be part of that application process. Okay. And then I mentioned the Habitat for Humanity is doing a fundraiser. If you would like to be part of that fundraiser artist, will you just email me k at katrinaberg.com or shoot me a text and I will forward that email to you if you would like to be part of that event. Um, 
Let's see what else I would say. Artists definitely go to the salon 100, the Springville salon, because again, even if you're not part of the salon, it's going to be such a momentous occasion. It's a great time to celebrate support our community and support your friends. And anyways, it's gonna be awesome. So I definitely say do that. And then the last opportunity that I have for artists today has to do with our topic. And so the invitation is to look for ways to be a disruptor in your niche. So what does that mean? So I thought about this recently because I was hanging out with some creative friends and one of my amazing creative friends, Leslie Smoot, was telling me about her niche in film and how she wanted to be a disruptor and the people that she's working with want to be disruptors. They want to find new ways to make movies and films and documentaries and all these things. And a lot of times, obviously the problem is having the funds to do it. And so they are becoming disruptors by finding new ways to fund their projects, new ways to produce their projects. And it's really exciting. And so as she talked about it, I was so excited for her. And then I thought to myself, okay, what does it actually mean to be a disruptor? What would it be like? What would it look like in a creative um, business or an art business? And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. So the first thing that I, I did was I looked up, like, I just did a search. What, how, what is it? like to be a, a, a disruptor in business. And then I found this great article from Purdue Online. They obviously have like an online program and this article is in there for like a business class. But basically this is what, and I'm gonna probably totally ruin the name, but it's Alok Chachaverdi, Chachaverdi. Okay, I'm sorry, but it's A-L-O-K-C-H-A-T-U-R-V-E-D-I. Okay, so this is what he, he is a professor of management at Purdue, and he says being a disruptor is not just understanding the market, it's understanding an opportunity within the market that no one else is leveraging. It means figuring out creative ways, not just to solve problems for the end user, but to give yourself a market advantage. Okay, so, so many great things there. When I think about being a disruptor, I think about just doing things differently than anyone else, and that allows you to be, you're kind of disrupting the system. So if everyone's going to the left, you go to the right. If everyone's, you know, jumping in the pool, you're climbing up a ladder, right? Like you're doing something totally different. So then a look goes on to talk about seven traits that he considers disruptor traits. And the first one is an entrepreneurial mindset. And I totally agree about this one. He says, being a disruptor is not just understanding the market. It's understanding an opportunity within the market that no one else is leveraging. And we just said that before, but that's great. He also says that, again, it's those creative ways that are going to help you. And so I thought about that and I thought to myself, okay, where are some examples that I've seen this? Okay. And I thought to myself, when my friends and I were just getting started selling our art here in Heber Valley, I thought to myself, let's do an online gallery. Now, this was a time when most galleries didn't even have a website. And if they had a website, they weren't even selling the artwork on their website. So this was kind of like, this was definitely disrupting the system. It was the time when blogs were taking off. I had a blog. It was easy for me to do stuff every week, you know, every, so basically we did a blog post. I did one every day of the week. Um, I think there were five, were there five of us artists in the gallery? And so everybody gave me four new pieces every month. And then I would share one of their pieces one day during each week. And so every day you could open up our website and read about one new piece. And then I also sent it out to the email list. So we were doing all kinds of things. It was the first time I really started doing email lists. And so again, this is a long, long time ago. This is before Instagram or any of those social media. I think Facebook had just barely started. Um, I remember having cute Tammy. Uh, she helped create our Facebook page. And I didn't even know what a Facebook page for a business was at the time. And she helped. She's the one behind um, June Pies and Heber. She's amazing. She's totally a disruptor. I think I may have talked about this in the past, but she's a disruptor because she managed at first she sold pies out of her house and you would order them 
online, she would give you like the menu of the week. Maybe there were two flavors and you would order the pies you wanted. And then you picked it up between like a two hour window on Friday afternoon. And that was it. And then eventually she moved into a space on main street, but she kept disrupting because she didn't stay open all the time. Again, you ordered your pies at the beginning of the week, but then you had to show up during a window to pick up those pies. And so it allowed Tammy the ability to bring her kids to work and to make those pies. And then she would leave after the pies were made. And then she had young local students, um, teenagers, uh, maybe even young college students. And they were the ones that were there while the pie shop was open for pickup. And so again, so many ways to disrupt. But going back to the online gallery, like I feel like that was again, a way to disrupt. And then of course, when Instagram came out, but for the most part in the beginning, it was people just sharing socially because that was what it was meant for, right? It was a social media post. And so everyone was sharing socially. And then some of us artists started to actually share what we were working on creatively. And we saw that kind of really build our business. And so that was amazing. And then I noticed when TikTok came out, I had some artist friends jump on TikTok and they had they were definitely disrupting by sharing their artwork on TikTok. And that was amazing to watch. So again, any then I think you can really help with the whole, just the way the flow is going, right? And it also encourages others to do the same, which is amazing. Okay. Now let's do, let's do this next one, which is risk taking. So this is the trait number two. And so basically this idea is that with, if we're not if we're not taking risks, we don't know if we can actually change from the flow that everyone else is going. So we don't necessarily want to be reckless, but we want to be able to clearly see the risk assessment of each possible choice. So one of the things that I noticed that that I saw personally, I remember when I was first doing art markets, my cute friend Nancy is like, you, this is cute Nancy, wacky Nancy of paper and felt is that what they're called? They're just paper and felt. But anyways, she's like, Trina, you need to do these art markets. They're amazing. And I'm like, well, or she just said markets, you need to do markets. And I'm like, well, isn't it just for crafts? She said, well, they're selling art there. And I'm like, okay. So I went ahead and tried it. And again, I think about that. That was a risk for me because I didn't think that I could sell art at a craft fair. And maybe I shouldn't say craft fair, but a craft market. And yet, because Nanette of the Utah art market was selling art and it was kind of disrupting that market by selling fine art instead of just crafts. There were a lot of us that were really seeing some success in the beginning of our businesses because of these markets. And it was amazing. Another example, it was because of those markets that I decided that I would apply for Swiss days. And again, I never wanted to do Swiss days because again, it's a craft fair. It's a huge, huge craft fair. And I thought, oh, that's not a good place for me. It's not the niche. It's not the proper place for fine art. And yet when I did it, I realized, oh my gosh, this is the best show I've had ever. And then the next time I did it, wow, the best show I've had ever. And it just seemed to be this theme, right? So, and then the last thing I would say is like when you're doing ads or anytime you're marketing, definitely there are things that you want to risk by doing things differently and just doing something differently in marketing is a great way to disrupt the market. Sometimes it's not a huge risk because you can be really strategic about how much you invest in that disruption, right? Okay. So the next one, the next trade is called vision. And I think it's important that we're able to see the future possibilities and yet how to get there. And that's not something that is easy for everyone. But if you have that, like, if you're really good at looking down the road, this is a great one for you to really like just embrace. So not too long ago, I think it was, gosh, was it before COVID? Uh, so we have this beautiful art gallery on Main Street in Midway. We only have one gallery in Midway, right? I think we only have one. And it's Shari Omens and it's her little Swiss gallery. It's Darling in this old pot rock building. Anyways, it's, it's awesome. But, um, Shari Omen, she owns the building in the gallery. She's an artist herself. Her husband was an artist. She's one of those 
um, pioneering artists of Utah. She and her husband were kind of in these like beginning movements of artists and she's just an amazing person and artist anyways. So she said to me something like, Katrina, you need to just think about who you are as an artist. I know you're going to be the type of artist that does the art that you want to make, not the art that everyone else is making. And then she said, and you're not going to be worried about being famous. You're not going to be worried about getting in all the shows because you know who you are and what you're making. And that is what's going to be important to you. And it was so interesting because as she was talking, my heart was saying, yes, yes, yes. I've been trying to tell you this. This is just a confirmation. And I had been trying so hard, Carl and I, for many years, trying to figure out how to not necessarily balance, but how to navigate being a mother and an artist and making sure that those priorities, the, the most important things, our kids, our marriage, that they were the front and that the art was just supporting those priorities, right? And so this was just so... It was such an amazing chat and I will always be grateful to Shari because I looked back this past year and as when Shari told me that, I really started manifesting exactly what that meant and I started owning it because I knew everything she said was true and it was something that I really needed to just make happen, right? And so as I manifested that, I looked back this last year after about three or four years, maybe it's been five since she told me this. And it was so beautiful because I knew that that is exactly what's been happening. And I think it's so important to not be afraid to blaze your own trail. And you know, what Shari, Shari told me may not be the exact thing that you need to hear, but I would say when people are giving you advice and your, and your little heart is thumping away and you're feeling it and you know, it's the right path for you, listen and like, just go for it. Because we can't be afraid to blaze our own trail. It's so important to stay close to the spirit, stay close to our heart and let God guide us when we can't see clearly how that's going to happen. But if we have that affirmation that that is what we need to do, he will show us the vision and how to get there. And that's totally what's been happening. I feel like our family has been so blessed because I've really given, given up a lot of things that I was doing before in the beginning of my business to get my work out there and to make sure that I'm, you know, easy to, you know, just easy to purchase my art. Right. And now it's a little harder, but the things that I've been doing, thanks to the spirit and thanks to this guidance, um, of the spirit. And of course, Shari, I just feel like everything has been so much better in my business. I'm painting better than I've ever painted. I know I have a long way to go, but I'm just so grateful for everything that's happened. And it's because of this vision that was definitely, you know, that was shown to me and thanks to a dear friend. And so I'm just so grateful for that. Okay. Number four, the fourth trait is called agility. Now, I feel like it's so important, like we've talked about this before on the podcast, but it's so important to be able to pivot, right? When something comes at us, sometimes we can't just continue going the same way. We have to be agile enough to pivot. And then also, it's really important to say, to know when it's time to pivot and when it's, when it's time to just keep going, right? And so if we can't find a way forward and we can't see a better way, we need to be flexible enough to pivot and make changes, right? And one example of this was during COVID, we had Swiss days was all planned where, you know, everyone's getting ready. And of course, COVID hits. We were hoping that they would still have Swiss days, but the fall came around and we didn't do Swiss days. And so I'm like, okay, what can I do? This is like one of my best events of the year. So we did a pivot. We did a large pivot. I sent out an email. We had an open house at my house. We set up appointments for people that were afraid to be in large groups and they just had one-on-one -on -one time in the studio. That was amazing. And that was such a good pivot. I'm so grateful for that. Okay. Number five is persistence. So when it's not right to pivot, we have to, to remind ourselves, okay, Things aren't exactly working the way that I want, but is this something that I just have to keep going at or should I abandon and pivot? And when it comes to persistence, the things that I keep thinking about is email lists and this podcast, right? So email lists, like I said, I started doing email lists for our online gallery back in like 2008. Was it even before that? Maybe it was... It was about 2008, 2009 that we were doing that. And that was amazing because then I wasn't so scared to do an email list. I wasn't scared to put myself out there, realizing that not everything that we send out is going to connect with everyone, but it doesn't matter. We show up, we do the best we can, and we let it go. And that's been my, um, just my whole 
vision for the email list for, for many years. And so I would say an email list is something that's really good to pursue and to persist. And then of course, this podcast has definitely been a disruptor for me in that it's some, it's a long game and there's so many things that I can share and ways that I can support other creatives that are asking things that I asked maybe last year or six months ago, or even five years ago. It's so important to be able to share these things and not just for artists, but also for women, creatives, and anyone else that finds any of this stuff interesting, it is a long game. And so it's worth persisting. And that's where it becomes a disruptor because not everyone is willing to persist and to continue um, just being invested in one particular thing. All right. Trait number six is creativity. And this one's pretty, I think that for artists, it's pretty easy to admit that they're creative, but I think it's very hard for them to say that they're feeling confident about their business, which is interesting for me because I think that artists and creatives in general are really good at solving problems and that's why they are creative. But for whatever reason, they think that they're not very good in business or they're afraid that they don't have the skills that they need to succeed in business. But this isn't true. So I would say just hang in there and use it to your advantage because again, this is where persistence comes in, right? Anytime you're doing like art or creative businesses, persistence is key with your creativity of solving problems. So I looked up creativity in the dictionary and it says, um, it will, first of all, it really goes along with disruptive innovation. It says the ability to transcend traditional ideas, rules, and patterns, relationships, or the like, and to create meaningful new ideas, forms, methods, interpretations, etc. That is creativity and it's mandatory for disruptors. You have to observe and think about people's problems and how you can solve them creatively. Now that comes from a look from the Purdue um, article. And he, the last thing he said was, you must transcend the current market constraints and be open to fundamentally new and untested ideas. And I think that's the key because a lot of times we don't want to try something if nobody's tried it, because what if we fail royally? Well, I'll tell you the best things in my life have been my royal fails. That's what's led me to great things. And so again, I think that it's important to just not be afraid of being creative and trying out new ideas. One of those that I would thought about, what are the disruptors that I've seen in my creative career? I would say the Utah art market is the perfect example because I think that when Nanette started, gosh, she did a podcast with me a long time ago, like when I started the podcast back in 2018, and it was like her 30th anniversary, is that right, 30th, 35th? I'll put her episode in the show notes because it's so good. If you haven't heard it, you need to go listen to it. But again, when she started doing her art, Utah art market, there weren't markets like hers. Um, they So she always, she has like a four times a year market and it's seasonal and it, you can count on it. And anyways, there was nobody doing that. But within probably 10 years, others started to pop up. And right now, especially we have so many fun markets that are, popping up all the time and that have these consistent things. Like for example, there's the Bijou market. There's one of the Sun River Gardens. There's the one that I love at the Bright. Help me out. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, the Beehive, the Beehive Bazaar. That's a good one. There's the Sun, San, Salt and Honey Market. There's a couple new ones in Salt Lake that I've never even done. All because Nanette disrupted the market by creating a market, right? Her craft market. And then eventually she added art. And because she was selling art so well, other markets started selling fine art as well. So again, she's like the best disruptor. Definitely check out Nanette. She's amazing. Okay. Another one that I think is a really good creative disruptor was when Springville Art Museum did their $100 show. And that was so it was such a disruptor because at the time I didn't know any art museums that were doing any type of art sales. Right. And this one was a once a year thing. It was like a black Friday event. It was just amazing. I had never seen anything like it. And I still say that is such a good disruptor and every state or major area should create something like that with a museum in their area, because it's so fun to go and be in a place where there is amazing masterpieces of artwork, and then you can buy something for a hundred dollars. So awesome. So it's, it's just the best event. Um, and then 
the last trait that Alok talks about is understanding. He's, and then I keep thinking about how it's so important to keep learning, to keep studying everything you can in your niche, right? Your market might be different than my market, but I think it's important to be constantly aware of what's happening in your market. And then also it's important to cross trade. So whatever you're learning about specifically in the art world, in your community, look and see what other people do are doing in other art communities. Look at the other creative entrepreneurs that are local to you and what they're doing to disrupt and what you can also kind of like, how can you tweak it and make it work for you, right? And then I would say just in general, I love listening to business podcasts, reading business books, taking classes. One of my biggest disruptors when I started like really implementing marketing into my Instagram was because I took an Instagram class by Hillary Rushford. Rushford? Rush, Yeah, Hillary. And I think she has two L's instead of one. Anyways, she's amazing. That was the reason why I really started taking off an Instagram. It wasn't necessarily the algorithm. It was just following some of the suggestions that she knew were working for her. And that was great. And another thing that I did was I took a class about press and how to pitch to press to get articles written about you, blog posts, all kinds of stuff. And that was really good. And I can see her face and what is her name? I will look up her name. I don't even know if she teaches that class anymore, but that was super helpful for me. And then I wasn't so scared to go after uh, press. And then the last one I would say that was a great disruptor that really helped me learn in, you know, in the uh, realm of learning was just doing a mastermind. I've had a mastermind with a couple groups of artist friends and that's been super helpful. And so there's lots of ways that we can disrupt and just elevate our learning so that we can just better our businesses, better our skills. And so those are really awesome. So again, seven awesome traits um, that you can think about. And I would say, as you listen today, what was one thing that you thought of that maybe you could be a disruptor or something that you want to try to disrupt in your niche or your, I don't know, your realm of business. So again, so much love from the Candy Colored Studio.